Jeff Kainange live tonight. Referendum or no referendum? We've been hearing this talk back and forth, every newspaper, every headline. We want to know, is it going to happen? And importantly, what is it about? My guests tonight, beginning with the young member of parliament from Kibra, Kenneth Okoth. He's going to talk about his thoughts on the referendum. And on my extreme right, a young man who we haven't seen on Kenyan television for more than five years because he had to flee the country, now lives in Uganda. He's a consultant in governance and elections. Guada Ogot. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Good to see you both. By the way, my Twitter handle is at Kuenanga Jeff. We also have at Okoth Kenneth. The hashtag is JKL. And my man Guada is still on analog, so we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that another time. <laughs> Mwishimiwa, good to see you on the show, man. I saw you on another show, I could say it. I saw you on Cheche. Very good, very impressive. And you are the new young leadership of this country that we need. And we'll talk about the uh, leadership in a little while. Gwada, you haven't been seen on Kenyan TV because you had to flee, man. Yeah, it was an unfortunate incident, but uh, it's good to be back home. Yeah? Yes. Okay, referendum. And, and your thoughts are very, very specific and you're very passionate about this referendum. And you feel it's going to happen, don't you? I'm committed to the referendum happening. I know the seriousness with which we are taking it. I know it will cost the country some money, but the timing is right. The, the reasons are right, and we just have to explain to the people. And there's a number of steps before we actually get to a referendum. So I hope today we will talk about that and the Kenyans will live enlightened, understanding exactly how the process will happen. Okay, let me ask you this. First, it started off as a 13-point plan at Saba Saba. Yes. Last few weeks, there's been a lot of um, back and forth within yes. Cord. Yes. And it looks like it's been narrowed down to three. Could be less in the end. And the three that we are all familiar with are disbanding IEBC, uh, more monies reallocated to the counties and of course insecurity yes. is that basically what we want to talk about is that is that who are those the issues those are the major key issues that the party is talking about and um, I would add on one or two other issues that I'm thinking about that need to be added on mm -hmm. and so as we talk about the process is we had called for a national dialogue before Saba Saba mm -hmm. and we wanted a national dialogue outside of parliament because parliament has got a very specific mandate and format only elected MPs go in and debate the president can't come representatives of civil society can't come representatives of youth workers farmers can't come we wanted a national dialogue that brings in all members of our community then anything that is agreed in the national dialogue then we give parliament as an instrument of our constitutional system to go in and follow the spirit of this recommendation and this dialogue and put what needs to be put into law. The executive, go in and execute this according to what we've agreed in and this is what will save our country. But the president and his team have a right to reject our dialogue as they did. We are disappointed but we also know that we are a free country with a constitution with rights and we can use our constitutional rights and say if you don't want that format of dialogue then let us go to the people through popular initiative. Mm -hmm. And part of the issues that we are saying we haven't settled on all of them that will be on the referendum is because as we look for this one million signatures and our commitment is to get five million signatures, as we look for the minimum 24 counties, we know as code, I know, we're going to get at least 30 of the 47 counties on our side. Well, so hold, those are the issues. Hold yeah. that thought because yeah. I, we'll talk about Article 257 in a yeah. moment. But Guada, referendum, you think it's, it's nonsense, don't you? First, uh, we need to contextualize this referendum call. Uh, all over the world, from 100, from uh, 2000, to the year 2000, we have had 197 referendums, of which 19 have been held in Africa. The East Africa region has had seven referenda from 2000. All of them have been constitutional in nature. Why I mentioned the year 2000 is because most of them derive from the events that triggered off. Uh, the fall of the Iron Curtain. The four issues that, and part of the reform processes that have undergo, uh, Africa has undertaken from the year 1990. The reform processes in Africa have largely covered four areas. Uh, the reinstatement of executive term limits, judicial reforms, land reforms, and uh, IEBC or electoral commission, electoral management bodies. Now, the, key, the issues that are being brought in, it's, it's very premature to comment on them for one reason. One, Referendas normally derive of very specific 
issues that require short circuiting of parliament for resolution now when you bring in 13 issues or you bring in three issues then it's very unclear because each of these issues comes with specific and inherent circumstances when you talk about the if for example the issue is the iebc then there are issues about who will manage and organize that 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 referendum so it's a diff completely different set when you talk about insecurity or security how will you craft the question is it to reform the uh, uh, the security agencies and reforming security agencies is a slow process uh, that i think has already st we started taking place here we've seen the same in zimbabwe and in many other african countries south africa for example if on the other hand it is uh, the issue of devol devolving money to the regions that then becomes a completely set it brings in a completely new set of uh, focus mm. so for example can it, can it work uh, is it too soon for a referendum? It, I think one, it's too soon for one reason. In 2005, when we held our first referendum, the issues were clear. Which draft? 2010, the issue was clear. Do we adapt or not? It's either or. Now this, it's very premature to talk about because you do not know what you're commenting about. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when it gets to a situation where you are going to hold a referenda, referendas have consequences. All the referendas that have been held in East Africa have come with dire consequences. The referenda that was held in Kenya in 2005 is what mobilized the violence of 2007. The referenda that was held in Tanzania in 2011 is the cause of the subsequent violence that followed for three months, the worst electoral violence ever. The referendas that were held in Uganda in 2000 and in 2005 were held against the backdrop of the violence that was raging in the north. The referendums that were held in uh, Rwanda, three referenda, was against the violence between the Hutu and the Tutsi. The referendums that were held in Burundi, four, were all against the backdrop of violence because Burundi, Burundi has been the most unstable East African country or Eastern Central African country. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, you say yes. It may, the, the, refer, the referenda can be conclusive, but there is a cost, there are consequences to referenda. That's on the broader perspective in terms of security or insecurity. Does it actually heal? Does it actually resolve the problems or it resolves but creates new problems? Okay, Moshimua, you okay. mentioned um, a million votes because we're talking about Article 257, which yes. says you don't have to, you can circumvent Parliament. Yes. Go to the people. Yes. Court principal Kalonzo Musioka said the other day they're going to get 10 million uh, signatures. And then court, court leader Raila Odinga says we will guarantee you 5 million. All you need is basically million. a million. Yes. That's all you need. Yeah. Can you get it? I think we're going to get more than 1 million for sure. 1 million is a basic threshold, but we want to make a political statement and show that Kenyans are with us. One of the key things that people keep talking about is that court is pursuing this just to say relevant or for power reasons. But we actually listen to Kenyans at the grassroots, and Kenyans are fed up. They think that the reforms process is not moving fast enough, and some of the things that are supposed to be accomplished have not been accomplished. That is the implementation of the TJRC report, mm -hmm. which, after the referendum mm -hmm. and the violence of 2008, we put in a Kenyan law, a TJRC Act, that gave us the commission led by Bethel Kiplagat. Mm -hmm. We spent money and went and documented and listened to Kenyans like the South Africans did. Mm -hmm. What are your challenges? What are your issues? What are your grievances? And we did that. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be automatically within six months of that report coming out and being published, let us set up a mechanism to start implementing the reconciliation process. And we now haven't we done that. We haven't done that. Our parliament actually has been misused. I'm a member of parliament. This parliament I was about has to been say, misused. Is it your fault, basically? Isn't you people in that house? Yes. The parliament of Kenya has let down Kenyans by going out and amending what actually, if you look at the context, that came in after a period of very severe pain and violence in 2008. that we said we don't want to go to. And we got the advice and support of other friends. And we Kenyans committed ourselves. To, let's not go back to that way of solving problems. Let's do it with honesty and truth. And let's work on reconciliation. Our government could embark very seriously on national reconciliation, restoring historical injustices, which in this country, many of them, are based on this poverty. Mm. So many Kenyans are poor, yet we fought the colonialists to get independence, to get back our land.
to fight po ignorance and illiteracy, to fight disease, to fight poverty. Kenyan tea, they don't feel the matunda ya uhuru after 50 years. Kenyans don't have access to quality education and health care. Kenyans don't have access to jobs. So even if we promise in the manifest of the Jubilee government, we'll create 500,000 jobs. The way to create 500,000 jobs in this country is to expand agriculture give young people ownership to land, give them the finances to do agribusiness, yeah. to export food, to feed this country, to have food security. If we're not doing those things and we're, not, we're letting the TGRC report rot on shelves, the parliament has let Kenyans down. Uh, Gordon, let me ask you this. Mwishimua talks about uh, Jubilee government and their promises and all that. So why not let them? Why you know, have only been in office one year. Mm -hmm. There's still another three years in change. Why not just let them? I, I think one of the major issues you must uh, 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 factor in when we're discussing politics post the 2013 elections is that the entire structure underwent a complete revolution. The principles in political parties were left out mm -hmm. of the entire... It was a winner-take-it-all. Yeah. So now, they have no national office? They have no national office and they have no platform from which to express themselves other than their political parties. For example, in Uganda, what has been done is that there is, there is an attempt to try and create national parliamentary positions for, parliament, for presidential candidates who achieve a certain threshold so that they have a chance to express themselves within parliament. Now, that becomes, when you look at it, even you people say that anybody will run for president and then become a national MP. Mm. But when you look at across African elections, you find that it is becoming mainly two parties. And those who achieve over probably a million votes are normally just two candidates, the winner and the runner-up. Mm -hmm. Ghana, uh, Zimbabwe, yeah. South Africa, mm -hmm. Tanzania. It's a two-horse race. So you're likely to have only one national MP sitting right. in that parliament based right. on his presidential race. Why? So you this, this basically is rewarding the loser. You don't reward the loser. We come from fractured societies, either, eth either fractured along ethnic lines, fractured along uh, uh, class lines. But what you need, what needs to be appreciated is that someone who is able to garner over one million votes has a, has a constituency that requires representation in parliament. Mm -hmm. yeah. You cannot, because in many instances, our politics and our political parties run off the oomph of individuals. Now, if that if people vote for those individuals directly, not even their political parties, when people form political parties, they move away with their crowd. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are voting for somebody directly, then that voice needs to be heard in parliament. What is the reward for that? The reward is that there is no time for any extra parliamentary debates. There will be less uh, uh, street protests because there is a voice and a platform from which to speak. Rather than go for a referendum, which in my opinion, in the current context, is purely about political relevance towards 2017, you can actually propose and amend the law to accommodate presidential candidates who achieved a certain threshold in parliament we're not looking at a short-termist view. We must look at the long-term view. What are we resolving? And even in, in context, the way Honorable Ken has spoken, that the issues here are issues of trust. Can a referendum actually deliver trust to Kenyans? Hmm. It cannot. So what we're looking at here is the issues that were brought in under the national uh, values and principles of governance. Hmm. We're looking at values. And two... There is so much focus we have put on legislation and we have forgotten that there is a need to socialize issues. There's a lot of issues like the ones he's talking about, like trust. You cannot legislate them. No. You cannot legislate honor. You cannot legislate integrity. You cannot legislate love. You cannot legislate patriotism. But you can socialize them. Mishima, let me come back to your question. Court relevancy. And again, you know, uh, three, no, two principles are not in office. The relevance is that what they're looking for? Is that what the former prime minister, the former vice president, are they looking for relevancy? Because out there, it's pretty cold. <laughs> First of all, I think let, let, let's let's clarify a couple of things. The court leaders, uh, Raila Odinga, is head of a coalition that is recognized in our constitution. With no national political office. System. No, no, no. He has a national office. In fact, ODM, the party that he leads, gets millions of money from the national government. He is an official head with a position and a title, so do not dismiss that. What I think God is saying, which is a really good idea we need to consider and I would support, is to say, how do you
bring voices like that. If you say you're going to use the format of parliament, if you leave voices of leaders with experience and with constitutions and real support, you leave them out in the cold. Mm -hmm that's going to cause some problems because you know we are not used yet to how do you exercise leadership and initiative in an extra parliamentary setup where you're not participating in parliament you know uh, so that's a critical mm -hmm. good idea that yeah. we could talk about yeah. let me give you an example people like talking about Raila Odinga and Kalonzo Musioka and it polarizes some people but let me give you an example uh, Abdul Badida mm -hmm. rain in a campaign that lasted less than 90 days and captured the imagination of Kenyans. And some might say it was a protest vote, but that protest voice is not being listened when you've put Honorable Dider out on the side. Mm -hmm. He was speaking on behalf of Kenyans. He got the Kenyans' imagination. They gave him their trust and voted for him. And what he stood for and represented is not happening now. So I think he passed the threshold. He got more votes than with Musalia Mudavani, mm -hmm. which proves maybe he didn't stand for much. Uh, he got more votes than Honorable Martha Karua, Iron Lady, strong person. Mm -hmm. He got more votes than my friend Peter Kenneth. Right. So somebody like Dieter, who got that amount of certain hours, we could say and craft a formula. Mm -hmm. How many votes do you have to get in how many regions yeah. or how many counties mm -hmm. to get a seat in the parliament? Mm -hmm. And they could bring to the table a lot of experience. If you bring someone like Peter Kenneth, who's been an assistant minister, into parliament and myself who's been who's been in parliament the first time if you bring in someone like honorable ray Odinga, who's led coalitions who's been part of marshalling our history he has paid a huge price and now as key decisions are being made he can't even provide context to national debates within a parliament that's a disaster so i think we shouldn't blindly adopt the american model and say yeah. oh when george bush won and the supreme court ruled al go went home yeah. you know that serves america we are not america we are Kenya mm -hmm. and we need and Kenyans actually have this misconception that Raila doesn't have a position although he's the official leader of the opposition and let's know. not forget and Quada he won yes. 5.3 million votes yes 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 he's got you know that's a 20, constituency 20, 20, 20, 20, 24 yeah. governors were elected on his party platform mm -hmm. you know so you can't dismiss Kalonzo Msiyoke okay, you can't do so I think that's a really good idea Thank you. we should look at it and see how we do it and you know listen to those voices bring them in yeah. and make sure it happens but I, it's not the reason why we're going to referendum Right. Let me tell you some issues for referendum Go. that have nothing to do with just specific leaders. Mm. But that's something we could easily put in even yeah. without a referendum. Yeah. We're talking about the nature of our government. Historically, we fought the first liberation. Get rid of the colonialists. Let us have an independent country. Let us put our system in order. Let Kenyans run Kenya. Kenya for Kenyans. We got that at independence. With the agenda that every Kenya will, Atakona got that for everybody. We've learned. We said political freedom. Okay, that was the second liberation. Let us fight for all voices to be heard. We got multi-partisan. That's the format. Our third freedom and our third liberation that we must fight for and focus on and do it effectively with the implementation of this current constitution combines the first and the second. Let us make sure we have political parties and systems that work, leaders who actually represent people are listened to and are at the table. That's one part of it. But let us represent the other things. That's why there's disenfranchised youth. If you look at young people joining gangs like Mungiki, if you look at young people drinking themselves silly in all parts of this country, if you look at young people getting radicalized to blow themselves up, to go to foreign countries and fight jihad, which is against Islam and become terrorists, that tells you that we have failed in giving them the hope and dignity. A young man who's 20, 25, should be able to have a steady job, start a family, raise children, mm. get married. But we, we, do, we don't have that. So let's combine these two things sure. and move this country to Vision 2030, everybody together. But Gwada, do we need a referendum for this? We have a government uh, in place, we have an administration in place. I, 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 you see, like I said earlier, I don't, know, I don't even know what the specific issue is because now in this circumstance, it is let us propose the solution and then find the means to that 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 and that in itself creates suspicion is it political relevance but in spite of that referendums have consequences in terms of generational uh, 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 opportunities the honorable vice president is a product of the bomber's discussion and uh, uh, the, DP, deputy. The, the deputy president yes. He made, he, 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 he mobilized his ground the first, during the 205 referendum. And in 2010, when he led the no side, he consolidated his base because now he had a clear base. Raila Odinga, 
the former vice, so the former uh, uh, prime minister, the boom or the momentum within, within which he got to become prime minister in 2007 arose from the 205 referendum. Now, referendums polarize countries but consolidate political positions because there are no middle grounds. So, so if you it, want to does it balkanize it balkanizes hold countries. That thought, hold that thought, I want to come yeah. back and talk about that. So what is the obsession with politics in this country? Why is politics almost like religion here? What is it? We are obsessed with this thing. Well, you know, why can't life just go on? Think about that, gentlemen. Also, let's talk about the leadership, okay. the next generation leadership. I'm talking to two young, brilliant politicians. Yes, even though he's in governance, Guada is still thinking about the future. This is what we mean when we talk about the future of this country. There are young, bright, smart people out there, and we're talking issues from referenda to future leadership. Jeff Kananga Live takes a break. Keep sending your tweets at Kananga Jeff, at Okoth Kenneth. The hashtag is JKL. And JKL will be back in a moment.